This is the Comics Alternative on location at Heroes Con 2018, the How to Read Nancy panel. Greetings and welcome to yet another episode of the Comics Alternative on Location, recorded at Heroes Con 2018. And on this episode, you're going to hear a recording of a panel that I was a member of. And the official panel title is Comics Canon, How to Read Nancy, and Other Indispensable Books About Comics. But before we get to that recording, I want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative On Location is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover price. Sometimes 50% off cover. But every now and again, you can find discounts that go higher than that. And if you go to DCB Service right now, you'll find, as you usually will find there, incredible savings on a variety of comics. And this includes bundles of titles from publishers such as Valiant, Marvel, and DC. And of course, you can find big savings on single issues and single volumes of your favorite titles as well. Whatever kind of comics you enjoy reading, you really can't beat the prices at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to DCBService.com right now. They will take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. This past weekend was Heroes Con 2018. And while there, I had the pleasure of being a part of two different scholarly panels. One was about the relationship between print and digital comic texts, and that one was titled Between Pen and Pixel, a recording of which we released earlier this week. The second was a panel based on the book by Paul Karasik and Mark Newgarden, How to Read Nancy, The Elements of Comics in Three Easy Panels. Andy Mansell, who oversees the programming every year at Heroes Con, wanted to pull together a panel of scholars to discuss the significance of the How to Read Nancy book and its potential place in the classroom and in scholarship. In addition, he wanted the panelists to discuss other important books about comics, comics history, and the formal aspects of the medium. Other panelists included my old co-host, Andy Kunkka, Craig Fisher, Jenny Law, and my new co-host for the bi-monthly on-location episodes, Michael Cobry. The resulting panel, How to Read Nancy and Other Indispensable Books About Comics, is part of the ongoing series of panels that Andy Menzel organizes every year, which he calls the Comics Canon. I want to thank Andy Menzel not only for pulling together this panel, but for all of the hard work he does every year in overseeing the programming at the convention. Our How to Read Nancy panel was a lively one, and I'd like to share that recording with you right now. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andy Mansell, and I am the uh, the program director for Heroes Con every year. Please, if you ever want to let me know what's going on, what you like, what you don't like, what you'd like to see, please don't hesitate to, to come by. One of the things that we've been doing for the last few years is essentially a comics canon panel. It began with, should there be a canon? And then it began with, what should be on the canon? Then the last couple of years, we've talked about the importance of books about comics, because you've got to admit, every time you turn around, there's three and four more. And we're just not sure. Now, the folks up here... They are from the academic world. They, you know, they, they've put time, life, everything into the study of comics in addition to other things. I'm just flat out a fan. And I want to emphasize to you the reason why I want to put these together is because I want to learn. But the other thing that's important is this is your panel. 
You guys paid to sit here. Don't hesitate to get involved with this, okay? The point of this panel started, um, I was talking with Derek, whom I'll let you introduce himself. Uh, we were talking about uh, books about comics, and I know the one that people kind of think of as being the essential uh, kind of textbook is Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. And that is really a terrific book, and it's really done a lot of, a lot of good. But a new book is out. I don't know whether you've had, bought it or not, but I highly recommend it, and it is called How to Read Nancy. And then we thought it would be really fun to come up with a book called How to Read, How to Read Nancy. So essentially, I believe this book is a must. I think it should be on everyone's shelf. Do they, do they agree? Is it going to be part of it? It's up to you. I don't know, but they're going to expand out into other books that they feel are essentials. Now, keep in mind, they're going to be talking about books. I'd like you guys, if you have want opinions on books, if you disagree, please speak up. We have the microphone. We're going to pass around. We're going to hand it to this lovely young lady here. No, <laughs> we're not. Uh, we're going to let them take care of it. You don't have to talk, Natasha. You can just take the microphone. And I just, again, I can't stay for it. I wish I could. I wish I could moderate it, but I'm going to hand it over to Derek, and I wish you all a great weekend, and thank you again for being here. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Okay, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for uh, coming to this panel. Now, the official panel title is Comics Canon, How to Read Nancy, and Other Indispensable Books About Comics. So, I guess... My assumption of this panel is similar to, I guess, the rest of your assumptions, and that is, I guess we're going to talk about how to read Nancy and other indispensable texts about comics. So I anticipate this being kind of a free-flowing conversation where each of us will talk about maybe not only um, how to read Nancy, which, again, this is the book. It is by Paul Karasik and Mark Newgarden, highly recommended. came out from Fantagraphics last year. Um, but we can talk about other books that each of us would recommend as well, books about comics, scholarly or otherwise. Uh, but maybe we can get started with quick, very quick introductions, because we only have an hour, uh, and I'll let everyone introduce themselves. My name is Derek Royal. I am the producer and co-host of the Comics Alternative podcast, which, by the way, this is being recorded for the podcast. Uh, hi, I'm Craig Fisher, and I'm a professor of English at Appalachian State University in Boone. Um, my name is Jenny Law, and I am oh, I am a, <laughs> I am a reference and instruction librarian at Georgia State University, um, and I'm also um, doing like comics history digging. So that's I'm new at that part of it, the comic stuff. And uh, I'm Mike Cobry. I'm a professor of English here in Charlotte at Queens University of Charlotte. And I'm Andy Kunka, professor of English at University of South Carolina, Sumter. And uh, I just came out with a book called uh, Autobiographical Comics. I didn't bring it with. <laughs> Craig, do you have yours? I and <laughs> and I, I hope, I'm hoping Craig I is do. going to mention it as an indispensable book. But um, <laughs> it just came out from Bloomsbury, and so I'm very happy with that. Thanks. Send the $10 down this way. <laughs> Now, I guess the book that got the ball rolling about this panel, again, How to Read Nancy uh, by Paul Karasik and Mark Newgarden, basically it's a book about How to Read Nancy uh, by Ernie Bushmiller. And I don't think any of us thought about this ahead of time, but one of the things we should have done is to provide an image for you. And what I can do is I can pass around my copy of the book uh, as... We, we, we go along, and so you can see what we're talking about. But the core of the text of How to Read Nancy is one strip, one strip that originally came out in August 8, 1948, and basically you have a three-panel gag strip. With the first panel, Nancy, from a distance, observing Sluggo <laughs> shooting another kid in the face with a water gun, and as he does so, Sluggo says, draw, you varmint. In the second panel, we get Sluggo hitting another kid in the face with the water gun, saying, draw, you varmint. And in the very last panel, which takes up about half of the space of the entire strip, we see Sluggo approaching Nancy, and we see Nancy only from the back, and she has what would appear to speak, from, to, from Sluggo's perspective, to be another water gun in her holster, 
but which is in fact a water hose that Sluggo can't see because Nancy is standing to the side of a fence. And so he says to her as he's approaching, draw, you varmint. And then in a fourth panel that, of course, we don't have, we can assume what the result is. So I will pass the book around. Um, And as I do so, maybe we can start off by talking about our own experiences in reading How to Read Nancy. Oh, thanks, Derek. (laughs) Handing the baton to me. Uh, I really enjoyed this book. I thought it was uh, a fun book to read. I thought it was sort of the apotheosis of what exists amongst cartoonists as Nancy being, in some ways, a kind of perfect strip for its minimalism, for its stripped-down qualities. Um, I... I, one of the things that I was talking with Andy Mansell about, and Andy was kind of the mover and shaker behind this panel, was he thought that this should be taught in introductory comics classes. And I think I disagree. And the reason why is because the book is incredibly comprehensive to the point where the beginner students would, A, not really care about Nancy at all. How many of you have read Nancy in the last 10 years? Oh, okay, there's well, a few. Quite a number of you. <laughs> I'm, eating, I'm eating crow here. but. <laughs> Online oh, that's wow. true with the, with the Olivia James strips, but yeah. but like but like I, I think that there is a, a sort of coterie of alternative cartoonists who really really are passionate about Nancy, um, Bill Griffith, for example, or uh, or Dennis Kitchen, Art Spiegelman. But uh, I, I honestly, the students that I teach don't read newspapers and don't read comics in newspapers, much less read Nancy, and so I think that. I, I do use understanding comics as, as kind of the formal text in my class, even though I disagree with many of the things that McLeod argues in there. And part of it is its accessibility, and part of it is the fact that it refers to superheroes and other genres that the students are more comfortable with. It, it's not an either or, but I think this would be a, a, a great text for more for a, a, a intermediate or even graduate class in comic studies rather than uh, an introductory class. I actually was very, um, very affected by the reading of this book, How to Read Nancy. Um, I don't remember ever reading something that breaks down, uh, breaks down a medium so well. So, um, if I can recontextualize it for our current situation for a moment, we're sitting at two tables. You guys can't see it, but these are white. Maybe you can't see it. These are white tops. These are black lines. So essentially, we could be a two-panel comic. Okay? So this book <laughs> takes this t- book takes a three-panel comic and does looks at each aspect. And by that, I don't mean just um, just the art, just the historical significance or placement. It actually takes, in one instance, the shadow around Nancy's feet. And that's a whole chapter, okay? So to me, I do think there could be a place for introductory students in this because I feel like it could be scaffolded. It could be taught in a scaffolded way, um, more intense for some students, less intense for others. But so going back just for a moment, so we're on two panels, and it would be like if we had an analyze, like if we analyzed the beverages that are on the table on one page, we analyzed what we're wearing on the next page, we analyzed maybe our ethnography or um, did some kind of um, survey to find out about our backgrounds in some way. Um, and so we could be broken down in these multiple ways, even though when you're looking at us straight on, it's just five people sitting at two tables. And I was absolutely struck with by how masterfully this these three panels were deconstructed by these two men in this book. So I am in love with this book, mm-hmm. and I will pass it on. <laughs> okay, I'm in trouble now. Um, <laughs> I, I will confess, first of all, I have not done the homework for this panel. Um, but uh, Andy told me he wanted to do a panel on how to read Nancy, and I gently suggested, well, let's broaden this to comic scholarship. Um, 
but I'm a good academic, so that means even if I haven't read it, I can still have an opinion about it. <laughs> um, there's a book called How to Talk About Books You Haven't Read by a guy named Pierre Bayard, which is uh, entertaining and annoying and stimulating in a way that only a French intellectual can be. So I'm going to follow in that tradition, as a, and just a, a few quick remarks here, maybe get to some other sources a little bit later in the conversation. Um, as I was trying to think about this last night, and trying to figure out, well, what in the world do I say when we get to the discussion of how to talk about Nancy? I, I, I do the only thing that I thought was reasonable. I composed a Facebook post. Um, and as I was writing about it, I just wanted to talk about the panel itself. Um, and, and stepping back from the book and maybe putting it in a little bit of a broader intellectual and academic context. And I was trying to sort of figure out how to talk about the panel. What, what struck me as someone who is relatively new to the field of comic studies, is the extraordinary vitality in that field. And I think what we are seeing, and I think this book, as much as I know about it, sounds like an example of that, is what we're seeing in this field of study is, is over the course of the last maybe decade or so, which is not a long time in academic history, is this robust discussion and putting together of a tradition in comics and a robust discussion of the grammar of comics form. And that's really different from what's happening in the world that I inhabit most of the time in literary studies. So I'm looking forward to reading the book. I'm ready to talk about superheroes whenever we get to that. Um, and it sounds great. I'll just pass it on from here. So I guess, Jenny, in your uh, metaphor, I'm the punchline of the comic strip? Or <laughs> in the, yeah, I'm about, uh, at some point I expect then to fully get... If I'm if I'm in the position that Sluggo is in at the end of that panel, I'm going to <laughs> get, get hit in the full in the face yeah. with a garden hose. Um, yeah, so um, I don't I don't know exactly how much to add to what um, what the others have said. One of the things I've been thinking about with with how to read Nancy that um, that I really found fascinating and enjoyable with the book, and I think Jenny alluded to this too a little bit, is that for for each section of the or each chapter basically where they where uh, Karasik and Newgarden break down the strip into its component parts, they have separate kind of sub-chapters called context and text, right? And so in the context section, it'll be like when, you know, one of the things I found fascinating was when was the squirt gun invented? How popular was were Westerns at the time that this comic strip was made and so on? So what, um, you know, what kind of things a reader would have brought to the strip when, if they read it live in 1949. And so thinking about that from a teaching perspective, um, I don't know if I would, I would teach this book in, in a class on comics or in, uh, until maybe, you know, much, much later on in a student's uh, career. But there's something about the idea of doing a kind of critical thinking exercise, I think even with, first year writing students where I could give them a Nancy strip and say, you know, what would it have been like for somebody to have read this in 1949? I want you to research the references, the images, things like that, and kind of push them to keep breaking it down, at least in the context side of things, maybe not necessarily in the, um, the text side of things so that they don't necessarily, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect them to have to explain why, Sluggo has three motion lines rather than two or four <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to indicate that he's he's about to draw, um, and, and or, or or things like that. But I think that uh, so it wouldn't necessarily be something. Maybe I would ask the students to buy, but maybe put on reserve in the library and say, you know, take a look at this book. It, 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 but here's the assignment: you don't have to look at the book if you kind of feel like you get the assignment, but. If, if you're struggling with what to write about, take a look at this book and see just how deep they go into it. And you can do that too. I mean, you could figure out when the squirt gun was invented. You could figure yeah. out, when, or, or whatever it might be, a jukebox and so on. And, you know, and that's one of the richness, um, the part of the richness of this text by Karasek and New Garden that's being passed around right now. And that is, as I mentioned, the core of the book is a 44-step, very close, aesthetic, formalist reading of this Nancy strip. And that's it, plain and simple. Um, but the majority of the text that is in that book is the context. 
And we find that not only within each of the individual chapters or steps, and there are 44 of them again, uh, but also and especially in the end notes. I mean, that's where you get the information, Andy, that you pointed out about yeah. the, the westerns and the squirt gun and whatnot. The but also how many gang. The history yeah. of the yeah. hose gang, yeah, yeah which I found, found uh, especially uh, illuminating. <laughs> now, one of the things I find curious, I mean, Andy and, and Craig, both of you mentioned something about the teachability of this text. I mean, I, I, I agree. I don't know if I were teaching or next time I'm teaching a comics class, I wouldn't assign this book or require the students to get it. But I tell you, the core, those 44 steps, I don't see why an undergraduate class couldn't very much benefit by that kind of close reading. Mm -hmm. I think it would take a lot of class time, and I may have to make a decision. I'm like you, I use Understanding Comics. So would I cut Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud and then use this instead, you know, the 44 steps of a close reading of a Nancy strip? I'm not exactly sure. I've never... <clears throat> done so, and I probably never will, teach a creative writing course in comics, or I guess the creative writing equivalent of, of uh, illustration art. But I could see this as being especially essential in those kind of classes. Uh, one of the things I wanted to get to uh, when I was talking about this, too, is because somebody mentioned the the new Nancy, the Olivia James Nancy. How many of you have read the new, the new Nancy, which is pretty controversial right now. <laughs> uh, but one of the criticisms that it gets all the time is, or it's getting a lot recently, is that Nancy spends a lot of time online. She's <laughs> on her cell phone a lot and she's doing, she's doing, and then, and people are claiming, well, Bushmiller's comic strip was timeless. You could take a Nancy comic strip from the 1940s and 50s and it would make just as much sense today. What this book did was made me appreciate what Olivia James is doing a lot more because you could, you can say it's timeless now, but in the midst of the, the, you know, wave of Western TV shows when, you know, what is it like two thirds of the television shows <laughs> on network television were Westerns, this comic strip was a different had a different effect on readers, and we're kind of now used to what the the kind of playing cowboys and stuff like that. Whereas that might have been a brand new thing in 1949. So I feel like like maybe 50 or 60 years from now, there should be a new How to Read Nancy, which is about <laughs> I don't know if you've seen the strip. The very first strip has uh, Nancy really going to town on some cornbread. Uh, maybe we could, we could break that. We could break that down. I mean, that's a good point, because how many of our students today know what the word varmint refers to, <laughs> and how many of them have heard of, heard of it within a particular context? I mean, maybe quite a number. I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I would just assume that I may have to explain very briefly, this is what a varmint is. Well, and that's, I think that, that ties into what you were saying about um, being timeless. Mm -hmm. I can say something's timeless from my references of mm -hmm. what I enjoyed as a kid. Right. But someone that's 20 years old, like, for example, I was wearing a B-52s t-shirt, yeah. one of my favorite bands. <laughs> I went into Home Depot to buy something or other. And the saleswoman looked at me, she was very young, and she said, oh, like the energy drink. And I was like, no, <laughs> no. Is there an energy drink? I guess so. So, you know, yeah, there's this idea that um, if we're codifying, as you were saying, kind of the the terms that we're using in, in comic scholarship, you know, we have to be open to, particularly with these visual interpretations and the, the, the comics that are kind of time capsules, that that's going to shift. And I think it's great Nancy's on the internet. I think... <laughs> That I think Ernie Bushmiller would be like, yeah, of course. Yeah, she's gonna be on the internet. She's gonna be eating cornbread. She's gonna, be, she's gonna do whatever she wants. Yeah, she's gonna do what she wants, and she's got the whole like the whole world at her fingertips now. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say a couple things following up on, on what's been said so far in the panel. The first is to follow directly on Andy's celebration of Olivia James by saying that my favorite strip that she's done since she's taken over Nancy has been the one where there's this this little Nancy figure, it's kind of floating in space for three panels. And then you hear all these critics going, well, when you analyze Nancy and deconstruct the semiotics, of her, which, is ex which seems to me very much a slam at this book and the way it intellectualizes something that's designed to be so simple. The other thing I wanted to point out is that when I said I wouldn't teach it in an introductory class, I, I would absolutely recommend this to anybody who teaches any kind of comics class, introductory or otherwise. 
So, and, and one applicability that I can think of immediately is this. Um, one of the things that I talk about when I teach understanding comics is Scott McCloud's definition of comics, and, which is somewhat controversial in comic studies because it basically argues you can't call something a comic unless it has at least two panels. Mm -hmm. That is, there's no such thing as a sequence of one, so you have to have one panel following another panel or else it doesn't count as comics. And one of the arguments I make against that definition of comics is, well, what about the, the panel that gets created in your mind based on the evidence that's on the page? Mm -hmm. And so when you see that final panel with Sluggo walking up going, draw, you varmint, and Nancy has the hose in her holster, mm -hmm. you automatically create a panel in your head that creates a sequence, even if the sequence doesn't exist on the page. Mm -hmm. And so it can get into a dialogue into some of the things that already exist in my class. So I would overwhelmingly recommend this as an important book for comics educators mm -hmm. to teach or, or to read. I'm not sure that I would teach it to, to, to students unless they were more advanced, but I think it's, 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 quite, a, it's quite an achievement. Well, what's the name? I'm sorry, just to top on that, sure. what's the name of the spectral character in, in Family Circus? That they <laughs> not, me? not me? Not me, yeah. <laughs> because they, when you think of Jeffy saying, not me, you create the sequence in advance where Jeffy has messed up the room yeah. or, or, you know. <laughs> Right, be, or the one that I use or... is that famous uh, Charles Adams drawing of the Christmas carolers down at their doorstep, and on the roof, Lurch is getting ready to pour like hot lava or water <laughs> on them or something. And of course, you automatically think of the carolers burning in agony in the next panel. When you create, and that's you why know, we laugh. Yeah. And I think you, know, you create a panel before that as well, so right, you, exactly. you see him filling yeah. the bucket right. in your head. Yeah, that's true. You know, that's true. one one of the things, Craig, you said a moment ago. And, and maybe you were using the word loosely that um, that Karasek and New Garden kind of intellectualized Nancy. You know, in, in those 44 steps, I really didn't read it as intellectualizing Nancy. I thought what they're doing is nothing more than breaking apart piece by piece one strip as an example and just showing how it works and why it works and how it causes us to think about certain things, whether we're aware of those uh, phenomena or not. And so I think in many ways, so you mentioned something, Jenny, earlier about deconstructing Nancy. And yes, it's fun to make fun of intellectuals and academics and, and what we're doing here. But I think what Karasik and, and uh, Newgarden are doing with this Nancy strip is very simple. And it's very basic. And it's something that I think anyone can understand. And I don't think that it's, I don't know, putting it in some kind of intellectual ether <laughs> to where the rest of us can't understand what's going on. And that's one of the, the big strengths of this book, is that it brings it home. It takes a strip that most of us, even if we haven't read Nancy before, we're kind of familiar with the existence of Nancy. So it takes something that's familiar and tells us why it is so familiar to us. Yeah, just to clarify, I wasn't I wasn't critiquing them yeah. for intellectualizing Nancy. Okay. I was saying that Olivia James was critiquing them right. for intellectualizing yeah. Nancy. I would never make fun of intellectuals because <laughs> that's why I get paid. Yeah. So. <laughs> you know, I think one of the great values of, of comic studies in general and teaching comics, and it sounds like this book fits easily within that context, is it's teaching students close reading. So at the undergraduate level, our students are not used to spending a lot of time focusing on a single text, focusing on a single aspect of a text. One of the things that I always go back to is a line from Art Spiegelman talking about how he learned so much from reading mad comics in the 1950s. And he said, in, in, in public education, we're taught how to read things, but we're not taught how to look at things. And so it sounds like, in place of sort of deconstructing Nancy, what this is doing and what I think comic studies, as I've experienced the field so far, does so well is really engage in close attention and a form of close reading. And that's something that I think undergraduates coming into college are usually not very skilled at. Um, it's a kind of a revelatory act to actually look at something and to begin to notice the details, however simplified those details may be. So I look forward to pillaging from this book in the future. <laughs> Although I'm with Craig that I... I, I will still rely probably on understanding comics as an introductory text. Yeah. And I um, I actually think that this, to me, is, I would say, less, um, not academic, but less lofty in its explanations of the elements of comics. Mm -hmm. I think it's way more accessible, and that's why I think I'm... I'm a little surprised that 
maybe you wouldn't teach this in an introductory class. I, I, but I think you're right that the concepts are what you would hit on, not necessarily the entire, giving them the entire book. Um, understanding comics, of course, is a classic and it's, it's very well done, but I feel like sometimes there's a little too much information for someone who may be just learning about comics or might be a casual reader who are, who's trying to move into, you know, a deeper, deeper, um, experience. Um, and that's something that I thought was so done so well in this is that, yes, it, it's kind of maybe insane to break down a panel into, was it 45, 43, 44, 44? okay. 44 chapters, every single element. Um, but it actually, I think centers, centers what you're looking at a lot better and a lot easier than sometimes understanding comics does. Well, you know, uh, understand, understanding comics has come up a number of times in our discussion, and I look at the panel title, and it is How to Read Nancy and Other Indispensable Books About Comics. So I'm curious, the rest of the panel, um, in addition to, I guess, McLeod's Understanding Comics, what other texts might you suggest about comics that you would consider indispensable? And Why? For what purposes? I still haven't got the ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm a little light. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll begin. First off, two things. I, I can't seem to narrow it down to just one. When I teach understanding comics, my relationship to understanding comics has changed over the last twenty five years since it's come out. Um, when I first read it, I thought, "Wow." It blew my mind. I agreed with all its concepts. And now typically when I teach it, I disagree with about 50 or 60 percent of it, which is really profitable in class because you can get into discussions about whether or not these concepts are still viable. So, for example, one of the big concepts in understanding comics is McLeod's argument that the more abstract, the more cartoony a human face can be, the more it allows you to identify with the character more. And it, the more photographic and the more realistic a face looks, the more we feel a certain distance from a character. And I don't buy that at all. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I don't buy it is because I come from film studies. And in film studies, what you're constantly doing when you're watching a film is you're identifying with a photograph. You know, you're not, you don't, it doesn't have to be abstracted. It doesn't have to be an animated film. You can look at someone who has a face as distinctive as Humphrey Bogart's and still connect with that character and identify with that character. So it's right now when I teach understanding comics in class, it's the tensions between what McLeod argues in that book and what my students and I argue about in class that really makes it a useful text. As far as that goes, uh, I, I do think that there are analyses of individual texts and works and, and, and cartoonists that are, are, are as good as, as How to Read Nancy, uh, albeit more academic. I'm thinking of two in particular, uh, Bart Beatty's 12 Cent Archie and uh, Scott Bucottman's book on Hellboy, mm -hmm. both of which are great books. Uh, and 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 use, like, like Karasik and Newgarten's book, uh, a, a single text or a single group of works or a, the work of a single cartoonist to sort of expand out into larger observations of the way in which the comics medium works. Uh, I, I've taught both of those books, and they've, they went swimmingly. It was, it was wonderful to teach both of them. And in some ways, Beattie's book in particular is very similar to How to Read Nancy because he reads all the Archie comics published between, I believe it's 1963 and 1969 that cost 12 cents. He got as many of them as he could find, hundreds of Archie comics, and then wrote a book that's 100 chapters long about, you know, like, let's talk about the importance of Archie's jalopy. Let's talk about the ads in the Archie comic books. Let's talk about Hot Dog. Let's talk about the Archie's TV show and how that connects with the publication strategies of Archie's, Archie comics during the late 1960s. And it, it, it also is a deep, deep dive into a particular kind of cartoon world. So I'd recommend both and have taught both to great success. Um, so as I, I mentioned in, um, when I was introducing myself, I've been diving more into comics history. Um, so I would say books such as Nyberg's um, Seal of Approval, um, Seduction of the Innocent is a good thing to read um, to see the counterpoint. <laughs> um, but I, but in particular, I'm, most interested in women in comics and um, the work that's been done to uncover those women who've worked um, in comics for years, but maybe didn't have the fanfare and maybe have been lost to time in, in some regards. Um, and, and other um, 
other people. But, um, so there's, um, from girls to girls and there's a Z on this. Yeah. There's a <laughs> second. And it's by Trina Robbins and it does, um, kind of a, a survey of women, um, working <clears throat> comics. And then of course she has several books like the great women cartoonist, great women, com- um, great women, he- superheroes, I think is the other one. Um, there is, um, the Jackie Orms book, which is about the first African American woman cartoonist. Um, and it's comprehensive and it's beautiful, um, um, about her work with Torchy Brown. Um, and I'm drawing a blank, but there's, there's other, um, there's other comics history books that have been coming out in the last 15, 10, 15 years that dive into the comic, the comics work that was being done by women, by people of color. Um, and so I think it's great that that history is being uncovered and, um, in such a, such a, um, huge way because more and more books are coming out about it. So check some of those out. Yeah. Again, my approach is a little bit more general, uh, just in terms of, I tend to approach comics more from the, the, as much as I appreciate the formal analysis from the perspective of cultural studies and looking at the growth of the popular media and popular narrative forms. So one nonfiction work I always go back to is uh, Gerard Jones's Men of Tomorrow, Geeks, Gangsters, and the Birth of the Comic Book, which is a great narrative about the creation of the American comic book industry. Um, and how it's completely intertwined with the mob. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've also used, uh, in a slightly different way, it's a work of fiction, Michael Chabon's The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, which very effectively conveys a lot of that history as well, albeit wrapped up with a, a, a giant epic narrative. Um, I'll set a couple other books as well, just some recent ones that I've discovered. Um, I don't know if these are indispensable, and I don't think I would use them in a class, but I think they're really interesting, and this gets back to my sort of embarrassing interest in superheroes. <laughs> mea culpa, mea culpa. Um, one called The New Mutants, Superheroes and the Radical Imagination of American Comics by Ramsey Fawaz, um, and that's reading superhero comics primarily through the lens of queer theory, seeing them as symbols, seeing superheroes as symbols of marginalized groups. I, I think it's a, a fascinating argument. It's written in a kind of dense, high academic style, so that's certainly one reason I wouldn't assign it in a class. Uh, sometimes the argument feels imposed on the materials, but it's a pretty fascinating argument uh, nevertheless. Second book I'll cite um, is, and Craig has a piece in it, so maybe I'll get $10, too. Uh, it's called Comic Book Apocalypse, The Graphic World of Jack Kirby. That was edited by Charles Hatfield and Ben Saunders and published by IDW. This was originally the catalog for an exhibit of Kirby art at the California State University Northridge Art Gallery in 2015. It's got beautiful reproductions of original art and, and a terrific range of essays from creators and scholars, including Craig. I'll, I'll cite... His piece in particular, one called Crystal's Face, which is a a, a beautiful example of just a formal reading of, let me see if I can get this right, the splash page of Fantastic Four number 82, published in January 1989. And I think the... 69. 69, sorry. It's too far away. 1969, yeah. Nobody remembers that time Kirby came back to Fantastic Four in the late 80s? (laughs) I'm imagining. Um, But I think what... What that essay and what we see so much in the book as well is this great attention to formal detail, but there's an incredibly lively, personal, individual, idiosyncratic style. And I think that, to me, epitomizes the strength of a lot of what's going on in comic studies. Um, one, one of the recent books I would, I would like to mention recommending is a book by Brian Cremens called Captain Marvel and the Art of Nostalgia, which um, is the way I want to write about comics because he brings in his own personal experience of reading Captain Marvel and the, the inspiration that, that that had on him into his own uh, academic life and his, his, his interest in the character, but also into... Um, uh, you know, he, he digs deep into archival research that is really fascinating, like, uh, you know, talking to, mention, uh, Jenny mentioned Trina Robbins, who was in correspondence with C.C. Beck, uh, the artist on Captain Marvel, and he get, he's gotten some of the, those 
those correspondences to look at. And, um, and it's a really accessible book too. And, and I think it, it really captures how, uh, someone can, can merge their fan interest in comics with their academic interest in comics. Um, and, and along some other lines, one of the, one of the places I think we're at in terms of the academic approach to comics is that we're, uh, even though it, it's been going along, on for a long time, there's um, there's an attention now to kind of finding the um, creators who should be getting more attention academically than that aren't. And um, I think one very recent book that, that came out last year, um, um, Brandon Costello's Neon Visions, The Art of Howard Chaikin, is a, is a really good book about looking at the career of a, of a um, artist who was, you know, who, who did major work in the 1980s, but often gets overlooked because things like Watchmen and Mouse have the kind of, uh, you know, density that they do. Um, uh, as far as teaching is concerned, one in my teach a superhero class, one of the books that's become my favorite graphic novel to teach is uh, Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely's All Star Superman, and part of my um, enjoyment of teaching that comes from reading um, Mark Singer's book on Grant Morrison, uh, which is another another book I recommend in his chapter on. Um, I wouldn't teach that book necessarily, but his chapter on All Star Superman really informs the way I've taught that book. Uh, and then I want to mention two other things that aren't actually out yet. Um, uh, Keanu Witted, who teaches at the University of South Carolina, is is uh, working on a book on EC comics, specifically on their approach to race in EC comics. And that is going to be an amazing book. I've read the manuscript and, uh, everybody should get out and get that. I think it's coming from <laughs> Rutgers. Uh, and then I don't know what the status of this project is, but, um, something other people have mentioned reminded me of it. Um, there's a scholar named Dale Jacobs who is, collected every single comic published. This is Bart Beatty's book reminded me of this. Every single comic published in 1976. Right? And this is thousands of comics. I mean, I think, I think there were, I think there were like 500 Richie Rich comics published in 1976. Wow. So, um, and um, I was glad to be able to have, have like 30 comics that he didn't have for his collection and <laughs> got, got those to him. Um, I don't know what the status of that is, but I think that's a fascinating Project as well. Yeah. Uh, Kiana, Q U I A, Q Q I A N A, Witted, W H I T T E D. Uh, I don't know what yeah. the, where it's, uh, what status it is in coming out. I think it's going to be about a year. Yeah, one of the challenges of, I guess, and other indispensable, uh, indispensable texts part of, of this panel is, is trying to narrow down what we consider important or indispensable or at least important to us. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, there, there, there's so many books, scholarly and otherwise, that I would want to include on that list. Uh, I know that th this is kind of, I guess, my piggybacking off of, uh, your history. One book that, that I turned to that I found very useful, and I think it's very readable, it's a translation, Jean-Paul Gabier's Of Comics and Men, A Cultural History of American Comic Books. And I think it's a really nice overview, um, and interestingly enough, from someone who's, who's not American. And then two other texts that I definitely, definitely would not recommend to, to students, or I wouldn't teach definitely, I guess, in an undergraduate class, uh, by Terry Gorenstein, and both of these are from University Press of Mississippi, and that is The System of Comics, and then Comics and Narration. Now, the reason I mention both of those, and, and this brings us back to how to read Nancy, if you will, um, I, I tend to privilege a more formal approach to narrative, whether it be prose or image-based not that that's the only way of reading, it's just that's something that's always resonated with me. And so what uh, Newgarden and Karasik do in How to Read Nancy is they break down the various components, the formal aspect, the language of a strip of Nancy and why it works the way that it does, why it's so successful. Well, in many ways, Gronstein in both the system of comics and then I think even more so in comics and narration, 
does that quite successfully. With this caveat, I don't know if it's the translation of the system of comics, but I can tell you it is a pain in the rear to get through. <laughs> no, it, it is, I think, unfortunately, an example of academic writing that is like slicing through thickets. <laughs> so it's not the easiest read. It's a slog. But nonetheless, I think that there are quite a number of gems in there. But I think that his translation of comics and narration is much more readable. So either of those I would suggest. I don't know if I'd call them indispensable, but at least they're important to me. Now, I know that we're about 15 minutes before the end of the panel, and what we want to do, because I've seen several hands, is to open up the floor to comments and questions, and I do have a microphone, so feel free to speak in that so you can be picked up on the recording. While he's giving the microphone, I also um, thought of another book. Um, I actually reread it last night. It's called Why Art by Eleanor Davis. Mm -hmm. So it's not specifically two comics, um, but it is... It's hilarious, it's um, sharp, and it's a great examination of what it means when something is is labeled art and what it means when someone's an artist. Um, it's kind of a quick read. You can slow it down and probably get different things out of it, too. Um, yeah, it's, it's gorgeous, and her stuff in general is, is really interesting. Hi. Uh, my name is Matthew. I find stuff like this fascinating. Um, in 2003, when I was presenting my thesis for my undergrad in history at the University of North Carolina in Asheville, I presented um, to the head of the department that I wanted to write about the creation of the Comics Code by Frederick and Selection and Innocent by Frederick Wortham as it related um, to homophobia at the time and, and, and McCarthyism. And I kind of had a, he said, you like to write about trash culture. And <laughs> this was in 2003, um, or four, because I'd written about professional wrestling in a Greek, uh, mythology class and also <laughs> deconstructed a match for performance art and stuff like that. But it's cool now that books like this are being written. I mean, understanding comics was written in some, and you know, if, if you're reading Mouse, they were cool with it, but it was still in academia scene as trash culture. And now comics are really getting taken seriously. And I love that there's a, I don't know, hundreds of pages long book that deconstructs three panels. And does anybody remember when Comic Book Nation, Bradford Wright's book was came out? Was it early in the 20th, uh, 21st century? I'm not sure. It seems like it'd be, he was a historian who... Right. Yeah, he was, that was his dissertation. That was, and that yeah. was his dissertation, yeah, and that's another Purdue, book. In fact. Yeah. I would just like to point out that it was two years ago where I was hiding in my office with the door closed trying to get something done, and I heard one of my colleagues say to another one outside the door, oh, I guess in this department we teach comic books now. So <laughs> <laughs> we still have a ways to go, I think, unfortunately. <laughs> While the students are not yeah, registering in mass for the literature classes. <laughs> Hi, my name's Natasha, um, and my question is, uh, what do you think are, is the, the importance of books like Glenn Weldon's Cape Crusade, which talks about the rise of fandom in tandem with, like, the evolution of Batman in that specific case, but, like, um, what other books like that exist, and what do you think their importance is in terms of discussing fandom, which is becoming such a huge part of any kind of discussion with these kinds of medias? And there's a, there's a book about milestone comics and about, um, about comic book Jeffrey fandom Wright's too. Yeah, yeah, Jeffrey, yeah, Jeffrey Wright. Mm. Oh, I, I, I'm yeah. sorry. Oh no, um, I, I think that to me, you can divide them into like comic academia. I mean, this is, this is very black and white, but comic academia is diving in face first, seeing what you can find, looking at it all, turning it upside down. And fandom is, a deep love of something that may not include a close examination of it mm -hmm. may not. Um, it may. Um, and sometimes those can work in tandem. So I think it's interesting from a sociological point of view to, to have Glenn Weldon's book and things like that to look at who is enjoying these comics and who is using them and how. Um, but I think that that examination not fandom, but examination is different than the academic, you know, study of comics. Um, but I think it's both, both of them are very important. There's also an interesting collection of essays on 
fans and Batman, and I'm going to totally forget the name of the book uh, and forget the, the author Batman? of the book. Um, it is not. That's a much earlier right. one. This is a more recent book published by an Australian scholar who coordinated a conference I went to a couple of years ago, and I'm having a really embarrassing senior moment, <laughs> utterly forgetting his name and forgetting the name of the book. But if you give me a moment after the panel, I'll look it up. There, there's one, the idea and of it's a serious scholarly one, book as yeah, well. Another one that I'd recommend that is definitely like an, not an academic book, but gives you an inside and a very personal history of comics fandom, especially as it was growing in the 1970s. It's a brand new edition of Bill Shelley's Wonder Boy. Uh, his last name, S-C-H-E-L-L-Y. And there was an earlier version of this that came out a number of years ago, but a brand new edition uh, that is much more complete came out earlier this year. And basically what he does is he... It, it's a memoir where he talks about his experience with comics, and especially in comics fandom. And he's someone who was in touch, rubbed elbows with, and interacted, and even published a lot of people who were a central part of fan culture during the 1960s into the 1970s. Plus, it's a memoir, so it gives you kind of a, an up-close uh, experience there. I think I think there's two sides of this fandom issue, which is one is the kind of cultural analysis of the the culture of fandom, which I think is what Glenn Weldon's doing. And then there is the I think what I consider an indebtedness to the early fan scholars like Bill Shelley and and others. Uh and um you know, Derek mentioned uh, Gabier's of comics and men. And I think one of the most fascinating things about that book is his sources because he uses as sources a lot of the fan research that was done before there was an academic study of, of comics. And I think that more work needs to be done in looking into because I think in many ways a lot of, a lot of us might be in danger of reinventing the wheel that fan scholars had already done, but they did it in mimeographed zines and and so on that, um, you know, there may be 30 copies out there, but some, <laughs> some libraries are collecting. And I think that, um, that, that looking into the way those, those, those fan scholars were doing their research and, and doing it for, you know, no money and, and just to spread with monks a bunch of friends is really fascinating. I think a lot more work needs to be done there. Um, for a popular book, um, more popular book, there's the life and time of the Thunderbolt kid or Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid by Bill Bryson. Um, and it's yeah. about his comic book obsession as a small child. And um, that's in conjunction with the rise of there being mass publication of uh, comics. I just wanted to chime in with a couple of things. I would I would endorse uh, Shelley's book because the new edition, and one of the most interesting things about it is that the difference between the old edition of the book and the new edition is that he comes out mm -hmm. and talks about what it was like to be a gay fan mm. in the 1970s in a way that, you know, acknowledges the, the importance of gay fandom and, and such that he didn't acknowledge in the earlier book because he didn't feel comfortable coming out. So it's really interesting reading that. Also because that of his children, yeah. And because of his children, too. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is that I think there is an attempt by Henry Jenkins and other scholars to weld together the idea of being a fandom and the love and the sort of devotion that comes with being a fan with the academic rigor. He actually has coined a term called ACA fan, which is kind of an ugly word, actually, but, but, which, but which is an attempt to sort of acknowledge that maybe one of the things that could define comic studies as being significantly different from other forms of academia is to acknowledge that fandom, like Brian Kremens does in the Captain Marvel book, and, 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 and make it a more subjective articulation of why you love this material so much while still bringing that academic rigor into it. So well, and I would say that fandom, examining fandom is something that um, is very interesting because it's a living organism. Mm -hmm. um, so there can be, there's the fandom of Batman, and of course as Batman changes and has different authors and, um, you know, uh, illustrators, um, artists, um, that fandom can change for people. And so uh, that's that's really interesting too. Just to pick up on Craig's point about uh, that, that sort of merger of the fan voice and the academic voice, I'll cite one essay. It's several decades old now from 1994 by Scott Bukatman, who wrote the Hellboy book from his book, uh, Matt, yeah, Matters of Gravity. I'm 
mangling the title again. The essay title, I'll get right, X Bodies, The Torment of the Mutant Superhero. And there's a section at the beginning of that essay that talks about his struggle to break away from the, the way that academic discourse, as he says, sutured my fans' enthusiasm and energy for comics. Um, and uh, that's, I think, is a, a work that really, that particular essay talks about the need to weld those two voices together. Um, I'll pitch in a little on, on answering about that. I teach comics at University of Knoxville, not University of, Knoxville, University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and uh, I'm in education. So um, one of the books I read, I don't really teach it, but Matthew Putz's, P-U-S-T-Z, yes. mm-hmm. the comic book culture book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. kind of. Yeah. It's, it's about comic book fandom, and it's a weird, because it's kind of partly his dissertation, partly history of comics, partly autobiographical, partly looking at comic shop culture in the late 90s. So it's got a lot of fandom and comics connections. Um, but I kind of wanted to go back to the Nancy point and the, the talking about the intellectualization that may or may not be happening. Um, for a lot of my students, about half of them have read comic books and half of them haven't. And they're all pre-service teachers, the majority of them. So they're a lot of them are really tentative. And I'm a reading guy, so I'm a reading education person. So I look a lot at like um, you know text decoding and things like that. So... It's really interesting to kind of talk about, or for me, what that the Nancy book does, maybe a little too much for you know my students, um, is talk to the craft. I mean, you talked about giving it to artists and so they can see kind of what goes into making the book. What my students are really interested in, um, the ones who are because they're they're teachers and they're not unbright people, but they are they're scared. They're scared of comics because they don't know how to read them and they don't know what the parts are. And as a teacher. You know, as, as literature people, uh, we talk about the parts, you know, you have to be technical, you have to be exact, you have to talk about what figurative language is and all these things. But when they get to comics, they don't know how to talk about them, so they're stupid. They're, they, they, they talk about them like, oh, I don't know, in this picture they're doing this, and it's a lot of breaking it down. Like, how do you know that this is happening? Because comics don't move and comics don't make noise, but we do all this stuff in our head that makes motion and makes noise and, and kind of getting at the moving parts that define what that is. I don't think there's a work out there that does it. Like, I know that the, that, uh, the language of com, well, not, not the language hey, of comics, the, the, system the system of comics. comics? The system of comics. Yes. There's a book called Language of Comics that somebody right. named Saracini wrote, I think, mm. some Italian name that's close to that. Um, mm-hmm. But there's a lot of books like that, but they're not really accessible to like a lay person, I would yeah. say. Yeah. That's just a comment. Y'all are doing great. I there love it. Yeah. There's a guy behind you. Thank you. Hey, I just wanted to ask uh, your opinion on, if you're familiar with it, uh, Unflattening by Nick Susanis. Mm-hmm. Um, because I'm it's sorry. it's kind of about comics, but it's kind of not, but it still tries to fit itself in the academic world, I guess you'd say. Um, so how do you think that kind of... It was what, Susanis' what is dissertation, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 So what do you think it's, it's also published by Harvard, so that is one of the things that puts it in the academic, <laughs> I think, club. It, it's a it's based for those who don't know it, it's a it's a dissertation in comic book form. Right. Yeah. Hmm? Um, I don't know. I mean Derek, we talked about it on the podcast. Yeah. And rem- I don't remember what you said. I don't remember what I said either, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the details. <laughs> It's a, it's a really interesting book, but it seems to be almost a study of like conformity versus nonconformity rather than the principles of the medium, for me at least. Right. And the, it seems it kind of gets more in the medium of itself in the back half. I just read it last week, so it's still yeah. it's fresh. Um, but I wonder in terms of um, the study of comics and comics being taken seriously in an academic way, how... I mean, he might not be talking about comics as much, but the fact that he's using comics in a more academic way, is that kind of help change the conversation in terms of studying comics? Yeah. It definitely has. I mean, there have been people who have followed in Susanus' example to do master's theses and dissertations in comics form. Um, he himself has been a, a creative writer who has had residencies in places like University of Calgary and other places. It, it, it definitely... You know, being published by Harvard, mm-hmm. doing such a large project in a comic book form has really kind of brought yeah. 
more prestige than medium fish. Yeah. At the same time, if you think about it, there's really not that much different between what he's doing in flattening and what other comics creators have done in terms of exploring certain scientific, philosophical issues through the language of comics, but maybe having done so in a more popular format and through more popular publishers, so of course they're not going to get the resonance as something published by, by Harvard. And what something being what would be an example of one of those works? Well, <laughs> uh, a very recent example would be the line of science comics that First Second publishes. I would even think like the 9-11 Commission report is what came to mind. When I was thinking, you know, something that's completely yeah. outside the realm trying to use the medium for something different, I guess. Than just yeah, this is another work. The, the, the Robert Crumb book on Kafka is great. Yeah. Or Genesis yeah. for that. Or Genesis, yeah. 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 Um, I just wanted to go back to when you guys were first talking about whether or not how to read Nancy was something for your students. Um, you know, I understand that, you know, teaching you guys see and you all see with the students, you know, different people. I got friends who are teachers and they complain all the time about what kids know, <laughs> don't know, whether or not they know where spell check is or not. But um, <laughs> the thing is, is that, you know, I was reminded twice this week about how much younger generations do learn and adapt is that, you know, and, and I understand, you know, you probably wouldn't do it to first year students, but don't wait too long too is my other thing. But, you know, this week I come here and I see a lot of kids who, you know, read comics from the sixties and the seventies and their younger generation, you know, when they get through it. And, you know, a lot of that is because of what I think someone on the panel brought up was that, you know, these themes are universal, you know, regardless of whether or not the references are there, you know, we've all read, comics from and, and books from years before we were born and we still kind of trudge through it and get the references and it's just not a way to undersell but you know I went to a heavy metal show this week too and I see a lot of young kids with you know uh, shirts from bands that you know because it's kind of like here you know you see oh that's a cool shirt that's a cool shirt that's a funny shirt <laughs> same thing in both <laughs> places <laughs> and but you see how many you know like younger kids are like into stuff that you were into when you were young you know so it's kind of like you know, don't undersell them either because the second reason I say that is because as a writer, um, you know, for 15 years I've been reading how-to writing books. And, you know, some of the rules I took in easily, some I didn't. And some of the ones I didn't, I started taking easily over the years because of something like, came along like How to Read Nancy, you know. And, and I read a book by Walter Mosley recently, the author who his how-to writing book is amazing because for the first time it explained a lot of rules in ways that I, I was able to absorb it. You know, and sometimes if you wait too long with that, you know, that some people might get discouraged and move on yeah. to another career. So, And that's a good that's point. And it, and it also raises the question of what do we mean when we say that someone can't read something? I mean, maybe they're reading it in a different way and they're used to reading different formats right. and even different media. And I'll give you an example. Um, from my own personal experience, both as a parent, now my kids are older, but as a parent when they were, my kids were younger, and as a professor, um, my students were much more apt at reading the language of manga, at reading the language of web comics, right. much better than I was. And so when I talk about comics, it may be within some kind of context of like how to read Nancy. But when I ask them about comics, they're going to think about other formats, other means of delivery, you know, the manga, the web comics. And so they're going to be much more familiar with that language than with what, you know, the more historical way that, that I understand comics. And so I, that's, that's a great point. You know, we need to be aware of how people read, what they read, and how they interpret. Well, and I think, um, I think the, the fact that when the first part of our conversation was how to read Nancy and understanding comics, and those are the two that we pretty much identify as the way that you, like kind of a user's manual for reading comics and understanding. Like, I hope, I mean, because this one spoke to me more than understanding comics does, the more takes we can get on that and the more approaches, the more everyone will understand. Right. So, And, of course, one of the great things about being an educator is that one of the things you do in your class is you identify those students who are particularly passionate about a medium, and then you cultivate that outside of regular, like, class channels. You know, it's like, hey, I noticed that you're interested in this. Have you seen... How to read Nancy? Do you want to borrow my copy? <laughs> and, 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 and I've had 
the pleasure of working on, with students on theses about film and about comics where they really pursue passions in depth. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. We, I, I hope I didn't come off as condescending, like, no. oh, they're too dumb to be able to read this book, because, well, because I definitely want to cultivate you know, the students to go as far as they want to go in the study of a particular field. And it is easy to do, because with people you know, eating Tide Pods, you know, kids eating Tide Pods and snorting condoms <laughs> these days, I'm like, okay. Oh, we're back know. to the Tide Pods. Yeah, so. <laughs> they really eat Tide Pods? Well, what an appropriate way for us to end the panel with a reference to Tide Pods. <laughs> Um, we have run out of time. I, I want to thank everyone for coming to this panel and for asking such insightful questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our How to Read Nancy panel, and a big thanks once again to Andy Mansell for organizing everything. And if you want to find great books like Karasik and New Garden's How to Read Nancy, then definitely check out the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com, where every month you'll find unbeatable prizes on your favorite comics and on titles that you may not have known about, but you probably should. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about this year's on-location recordings at Heroes Con. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up your phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. You can also email us. We're two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can email me directly. I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And you can find us all over social media, such as on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. We've got more great programming lined up in the days to come, so be sure to check back for those episodes. Until then, take care.